Hello everyone, it's Richard Lewis here, and uh, today I'm going to be recording perhaps a longer and more rambly video than my usual style. I apologize for that in advance. Uh, it's lots of ground to cover, it's lots of stuff that's been on my mind for a while. Uh, and obviously I'm going to be talking about this PEA stuff, all of this WESA stuff, everything that's going on. Why, Basically why I believe we're headed towards an esports cold war in 2017. And I don't want to bang on about it. I have been saying for 12 months, I've been talking about conflicts of interest and, uh, you know, the way the money flows in esports for a long, long time now. And people just tell me to shut up. And this is where we're, this is where we're ending up. I mean, you know, the end game of what's happening in, in Counter-Strike, which is the game I really care about the most, uh, isn't looking good right now. And I'm going to tell you why. But, to let uh, you know, let's just start by saying, first off, uh, you know, I knew a lot about what was going on. I had people approach me. I held out in hope that there would be a resolution because there's lots of reasons why I don't want to have to open my mouth these days. The, the first thing is it's not politically astute. If I say a bunch of stuff that that is the truth, but people don't want it out there, um, are they going to try and leverage their strength to get me removed from my job with, with Turner? <clears throat> That almost certainly will happen at, at some point, quite possibly as a result of this video. Uh, second of all, I've got friends on both sides of this, and you know I, I, I'm friends with some team owners, and, and certainly among the player base, I've got lots of friends there, uh, people I, that I that I consider friends, and even the people that I don't consider friends, they're people I respect. Uh, not all of them, but I but I do respect a lot of them, and it makes it tough. But what, I, what I've increasingly realized in 2016 is that there's no friends in, in, in this business. No one money's concerned. Not uh, no one you eat in a people's bottom line. You know, there's, there's no loyalty. <clears throat> there's no um, altruism. Nobody's really looking to do the right thing. Uh, because to, what's the point? It's make hay while the sun shines and, and, and to hell with everything else. And, I, you know, the only thing I, I've ever really cared about, the only thing I've ever really been passionate about is just, like, telling the truth. Let's just put all the fucking cards on the table. You know, for good or ill, let's know where we all stand and fuck diplomacy and, and fuck tact and, and fuck everything. Let's just be honest uh, and, and see what that does to the picture, right? So, this is a bad idea telling saying all the stuff i'm about to say but i'm saying it anyway because you know fuck it this is this is the reality uh so let's start I and mean, i think to start we have to talk about how pea got started now right off the bat let's just say pea is the professional esports association it's another group of people posing as an association keep in mind it wants to be a league uh it wants to leverage uh collective a collective group of brands to get money. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not open to all, so it certainly doesn't conform to an association as I would understand it. And its principal focus right now is this league. So how do we end up there? How how do we end up with PA in existence? Now I'd like to bring you up on screen my report on the Daily Dot from April 2015. I can't do that at the moment because all of my work is being migrated across to the new Dot Esports website. Uh, so the only thing I have is a cached version. It looks hideous, but the words are here. So I'll remind you uh, that what happened in 2015 on April 9th. I, I woke up. Uh, my phone was going absolutely mental. I was hungover, can't quite remember why, probably it's a good reason, always a good reason to be hungover. And everybody, my Skype was lit up, my Twitter DMs were going off, and it was all about this exclusivity league that was going on, if you remember, with ESL, Vulcan and Twitch, and it took place in the Twitch buildings. And the plan of that was to lock down all of the top CSGO teams into an exclusivity deal. And the people that were coming in all represented the major players. Uh, financially, uh, everything you would need to be successful if you were to run an exclusivity league. You had all of the major top team owners that were involved uh, at the time. Uh, you had representatives from ESL, 
you had representatives from Vulcan, and you had representatives from Twitch. And Twitch always maintained that they, oh, you know, they were just using our building or whatever. I mean, Twitch were very much involved. Um, Twitch had ha held talks with some of these teams, uh, you know, at, at, at various points. Um, most notably, I, I think, in Katowice. So, um, this deal was designed to create a one-off, a one-stop one shop for everything that would make money Counter-Strike-wise. Twitch obviously would be the broadcasters, it would be exclusive to their platform, uh, Vulcan would handle the fantasy side of things, uh, so that particular league would be closed to other fantasy betting, most notably, you know, Alpha Draft or whoever was the rival at the time. And, of course, ESL were the guys that were going to run it all, and this would give them brand strength, and all the team owners would get in exchange money that all of these revenue streams would generate for their exclusivity. Now, when I, and, and indeed Lewis Mira over at HLTV.org, uh, published this, uh, ESL got incredibly upset that this had been leaked, um, especially because my understanding was that you know they they were literally had done everything in their power to keep this quiet i think they'd even gone to if memory serves me correctly they'd even gone to the length of taking people's phones off them within this meeting they wanted to sneak it past the community sneak it past the journalists have it ready to go and just drop it all on you so when it came out esl basically told everybody to fuck off they didn't trust anybody and they walked away from the deal, and they, they particularly blamed the owners. And it makes sense if you look at it from their point of view. Their belief was that the owners were uh, leaking the information to journalists in order to increase their um, value, bargaining power, to let other leagues know that, hey, we're about to do this exclusivity deal with ESL, so if you want to come and do an exclusivity deal with us, all you've got to do is pony up more money. We, we are now open to the idea of exclusivity, uh, and this particularly upset ESL, who felt that they were taking all of the heat from the community as a result, which isn't fair. Um, I, I mean, that should be abundantly clear from what I'm saying. Everybody in that room was, was on board with this, and, you know, uh, they, they, they walked away and they were like, we don't need this. We, we think we offer a good deal for the, for the teams. Now, what was going on also around that time was you had a, a conglomerate of other organizations that were looking to create an exclusivity league. This is the great lie that you've been told, that other organizations weren't trying to create an exclusivity league. It's a lie. They were all in talks with each other to work out a circuit a circuit and certainly there was meetings held at DreamHack Bucharest and beyond where other representatives from other uh, league organizers were coming together in various groups and trust me the permutations changed multiple times uh, and, and they came together and they were all talking about hey we'll have an exclusivity league to kill ESL and I'll be honest uh, I've said this multiple times I don't agree with everything ESL does I'm certainly not what you would call a fan of ESL, but they do have a lot of staff, again, that I would file in the friends and re well-regarded colleagues list. And also, I, I would hate to imagine what esports would look without them. There is no good or bad in this story. You'll quickly realize this is about control and money, and there's no hero, there's no fucking guy riding on a white horse to save esports from itself no one cares it's just about do i get to be the guy who kills the goose that laid the golden egg and maybe get one or two golden eggs for myself or is it somebody else that's it so all of that was going on esl walked away from the idea then doubled down and they came up with something called WISA, the world esports association which we all know and love and trust me WISA was born in this uh, uh, original idea of the exclusivity league that was its principal goal that was what it wanted to be and basically what they'd done is they'd got some of the teams that were in that room and, and maybe one or two that weren't 
uh, to agree to be part of this organization. And in exchange, I think it was $150,000 per team. And they would leverage their brand rights, their image rights, to be able to sell sponsorships and promotional deals against the collective strength of those brands. Now, we all know it got off to a shit start, right? Like, FaZe fucking bailed out super early. Uh, that was uh, a strange situation. FaZe were in, FaZe were out. FaZe had to pay back the money. And that was the other thing as well. If you leave, you had to pay ESL back the money. And then I think it was an additional $50,000 as, as a penalty. So it actually cost FaZe money t to leave, is my understanding. But Wisa comes out. And everybody said, hey, you're the World Esports Association. Where are all these North American teams? Well, the North American teams has had talks with ESL and had talks with Wisa. And again, it comes down to money. Wisa didn't offer them enough money. They simply didn't offer them enough money to join the World Esports Association. They felt they had a disproportionate amount of power. They felt the, uh, the money didn't represent their brand strength. So they, they were like, fuck this. We'll make our own. And that's PEA. That's all it is. PEA had existed in some form uh, before it was announced, but it was basically just a group of North American team owners, predominantly the high-level League of Legends one, ones, and they felt as a result of their brand strength, particularly with League, with League of Legends, they should get more money. <clears throat> so, they, so that's what PEA was designed to do. And they also didn't like the idea of ESL having this disproportionate amount of power and, and influence and leveraging what they think are pretty strong brands to, to get sponsorship for what they consider to be lesser brands. And to put this in context, you know, we can use a European example. Uh, you know, why would um, Mouse Sports, for example, get to leverage against, you know, a brand like Fnatic? Why would uh, Complexity, no disrespect, uh, to Jason Lake or Jason Bass or any of the guys over there. Why why should Complexity get to leverage their brand strength, say, for example, against, um, you know, uh, a TSM? And, 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 and what was more upsetting to the group was why should even a Fnatic get to leverage against the TSM? Because, you know, Fnatic, Fnatic were having financial issues, as everybody knew, and, you know, certainly came out with the Jens Hilgers loan that I revealed. So let's get uh, into, uh, you know, PEA. <clears throat> so PEA is formed. It takes on the idea that they're going to become this esports association. And the money that you would make is in the league. That's exactly what Wiesen knew. That's what PEA knows. You need to have a league. And you need to have all the top teams in that league. And you need to make that league the only place they play. Now, LCS has a lot to answer for, the Riot Games model, because that's how it operates. You have very few international competitions. You have World, you have All-Stars, and, and uh, the occasional IEM, where they deliberately limit how many teams can play. And because of that, all of the owners are like, this is how we make the money. We need to have a league. You know, We need to move away from the traditional esports uh, way of doing things, the traditional esports circuit and create uh, our own exclusivity league so to head up that league they needed a face a commissioner whatever you want to call it and they went with jason katz now jason katz is someone with a long tenure in esports if you're a veteran like me you know the name jason katz and not always for good reasons because the first thing I said to people at PEA when they told me Jason Cat was going to be in charge of it, I said, okay, just understand that you will now be at war with every rival throughout all of this year and beyond. Because that's what Jason Katz does. Jason Katz likes to fight. This is what he does. He doesn't have a particularly great CV in terms of success either. Now, Jason Katz is an entertainment lawyer, somebody very specialized in that field. And I'll tell you, he's a fucking pit bull. He is a fucking pit bull. He's got tenacity. I might not like the guy. We might not have a lot in, uh, so we might not have a lot of, of common ground in terms of what we believe about esports. 
but we're both little tenacious little pit bulls, so I've got to respect him for that much. And let me tell you, my first experiences with Jason Katz would go way back to CGS. And over there, Jason Katz was one of the guys that was very big on pushing the franchise model. Now, just a few reminders about CGS and things it did. And yes, you'll get CGS apologists to this day. CGS was not a good thing for esports. Yes, it might have uh, got us on TV for a little bit. It might have got made some people very wealthy, a very select few, but it completely crippled the esports ecosystem. It set us back years. It made us a laughing stock, and it made the mainstream media. It made us a laughing stock among our core audience, and it made the mainstream media back away from us for years. So it definitely did not achieve a greater good. Anybody who tells you that is lying to your face. The CGS franchise model in particular was one of the big issues and how this worked was you were given the option to sell your brand to cgs because they wanted credibility they paid through the nose for credibility they appointed everybody who had uh, a, a name a brand they appointed everybody that they could even if it wasn't suitable for the position because they just wanted to get big names in there no disrespect to heaton Heaton, at that time in his life, was still coming off being a player. There was no indication he would be a successful general manager. But it's Heaton. He is a star. We've got to put him in. They paid a fortune. You had people like Fatality commentating on Counter-Strike, a game he played once at a show match at a CPL. Competitively, that is. Uh, but he was paid a small fortune for doing it, well beyond the odds, well above the industry standard, because they were buying credibility. And what they wanted to do was to buy franchises, to buy existing brands. Complexity did this, for example. Complexity sold their brand, and what they were promised was, we take your brand on board, uh, we give you a job as general manager, you are installed as a general manager, you know, for life, as part of that brand. Uh, or it might have been for five years for the entirety of the, the league's alleged running plan. And you're allowed to run it completely as you see fit and leverage sponsorships against the group. Does this sound familiar? It should. Uh, the CGS was one of the original um, you know, pi pioneers for this idea of collectivization by the brands. Uh, but, but what you sold was the brand. I mean, you sold everything. The right to its usage, its history... Now, and, and you agreed uh, to only recruit players for the games that were in the CGS. So it was effective, you know, it was a very limiting form of control. Examples of brands that didn't sell were Fnatic, Sam Matthews, turned down all of the CGS offers. And um, what you end up with at that point is they were very hostile towards people who didn't want to come on board. And they went out and they designed franchises that they would draft your players into. So, for example, Dignitas went to the uh, Combine, as it was called, because it was all very American back then, which is why this Overwatch League sounds, you know, a little bit alarming when they use these terms. They went to the Combine and Odie was told, hey, you're going to be a general manager anyway for Birmingham Salvo. So he drafted the Dignitas team, team who they knew. And to be fair, they were the best. I mean, they smashed the team I was there with. I was managing Zeb Board. But the, the bottom line was, you went there for the players and you knew if you won the tournament, the, the uh, players were going to get drafted. You would lose everything. All you gained was short-term exposure. If you, if you succeeded and they got drafted, you were going to have to replace those players. It wasn't a great deal. For esports as a whole, so uh, so that was CGS, and I, I won't ramble on too long about that. We talk about CGS all the time because it's a touchstone for esports failure. And then we move into the LCS where Jason Katz worked. Now there was a draft that was handed to organizations way back when they first planned the first season of LCS, and it was unbelievable. These organizations had to agree that they would give away their entire brand, their entire history, their logo, all of that good stuff across to Riot Games. And there was a group of team owners 
that where there was that said there's absolutely no way we're going to do that and Alex Garfield in particular who had one of the biggest brands at the time were a very big vocal proponent of it now keep in mind that Riot Games were also running all kinds of shit like you couldn't have a Dota 2 team if you wanted to be in this all new all singing LCS league they tried to overreach and then when it came out they publicly denied it even though notable figures admitted it and people who've publicly denied it have admitted it to me privately that this happened so it definitely happened and I'm confident it happened because I know Riot Games employees who told me that it was going to be done that way. Now, to all, uh, by all accounts, Jason Katz was one of the guys that came up with this. He was very vocal about wanting to do things that way. You know, I don't know why he feels that's a good way to do things, especially given he was directly involved with a cataclysmic failure that fucking set esports back years. I, I like to learn lessons from my mistakes. Not, he seems to think it wasn't a mistake, and they try and do it with LCS. Players, uh, sorry, team owners rejected the original drafts and eventually a, a contract that was still pretty egregious and overreaching uh, w was agreed, but it was nothing like that famous original draft. And again, go out to some of the team owners that are out of the game now and ask them about it if you don't believe me. Also, where has Jason Katz worked? Well, he worked at Azubu. And let me tell you, Jason Katz over there, he was, um, again, he liked to fight. He, he liked to take on the uh, rivals. One of the reasons why Azubu was overpaying a lot of its streaming talent was because Jason Katz used to sign off on it. He used to have this thing, um, an, uh, an ROI calculator. He used to work out whether or not somebody was worth the return of investment and it, it would be at his behest and if they wanted to go out and aggressively take someone from twitch they would do it and they did it often and they did it pretty much based on his metrics he would say whether or not this was a good move but it was very aggressive very hostile they wanted to take top streamers from twitch and they made no bones about it and sometimes they worked and, and sometimes it didn't but to him it was a battle and again I suppose within the context of streaming, I said for the longest period of time, you know, Twitch was an example of a benign monopoly, but monopolies don't stay benign for very long. The whole idea of do no harm quickly goes out the window when you can when you realize you can get an industry by the fucking balls and squeeze as tight as you like and no one's going to stop you. Uh, and we're getting to that stage now, unfortunately, with Twitch. And we've seen examples of that. So, yes, Jason Jason Katz was a, a terrier, a pit bull, like I say. He was very much into this idea of wherever he goes, a battle must ensue. And so it came to PEA. Uh, now, again, some of the owners involved, I'm, I'm sure, are happy about that. But not all of them are. And they're a little bit taken aback by the fact, like, hang on, this, why don't we just set up our own thing? Why do we have to go to war and tear other people's things down? But this is what Jason Katz likes to do, and that's the direction he's going to tell people to go in. So just recently, we sir asked several uh, teams that, that are that are on the, in the Wisa group in the Wisa family if they'd be willing to go exclusive. As in, play an exclusivity league with ESL. And keep in mind, Wiesa calls itself the World Esports Association, but openly admitted at launch and beyond that they didn't see the need to invite anybody else to the table. Just ESL. So, pretty small fucking world, in, in my opinion. Now, what's interesting about this is Wiesa doesn't seem to have a lot of clout. Outside of the Jens Hilgers uh, influenced teams, shall we say, um, a lot of them d don't need to play games. They're owned by ES Force. They don't need to play, so they were like, yeah, nah, we're not going to do that. We're just not going to do that. Then PEA heard about this. So PEA were like, well, fuck it. We're going to double down, actually. Fuck ESL. Trying to ha have an exclusivity league. We're going to fight back. And that's when we get to this report by my namesake, uh, DK. Obviously, he's a Lewis as well. Jarek Lewis, no relation. Although he's doing great work. 
And you can see here, PEA plans to outlaw its teams. This was on Slingshot, by the way, a fine publication, actually doing good work in, in uh, esports journalism. Uh, D PEA plans to outlaw its teams from playing in the ESL Pro League, according to sources. Let me be the first to say publicly, um, you know, and I'll put my name on it, this happened. This is true. Jarek's right. This isn't a lie. This isn't fiction. You know, this is absolutely exactly what was going on uh, behind the scenes. M multiple players have told me, uh, you know, multiple, uh, you know, s sources have told me this from people who would know. It's happened. That's what that's what's been going on behind the scenes. We're going to get into more of the details of that in a moment, but it's absolutely true. So you can see here, it says the Professional Esports Association plans to outlaw its Counter-Strike teams from playing in the next season of the ESL Pro League, according to multiple sources. PA plans to follow through with this decision in spite of dissent from a handful of players on teams within the association. PA has also offered to partner with the ESL to hold a global finals tournament featuring finalists from multiple CSGO leagues through the World Esports Association, an association comprised of seven European organizations that is aligned with ESL. And, and and they have of now declined that offer according to a source with knowledge of the discussions. I'm going to tell you about these global finals in a moment. You'll understand why this offer was declined. Some players are unhappy with the PEA decision to not participate in EPL and lobbying for some sort of agreement between the two organizations. One source explained that the players fear the inexperience of the new league and deserve a right to choose the leagues they play in. If players attempted to play the next season of the ESL Pro League, which begins in February, it would result in a breach of contract with their organizations. PA launched in September and is comprised of seven North American organizations, including Team Solo Mid, Team Liquid, Cloud9, Counter Logic Gaming, Immortals, NRG Esports, and Complexity Gaming. The association promises a 50% share of profits and provides financial benefits to the players as members of the respective teams. PEA's announcements followed the formation of WISA, which is comprised of Fnatic, Natus Vincere, Envious, Virtus Pro, G2 Mouse Sports, G2 Mouse Sports, and Ninjas in Pajamas in May. With the addition of PEA, which also plans to operate its own league, there are more leagues than ever in professional camps right heading into 2017. Tell me about it. Brother, WISA and PEA did not respond to requests for comment, and they wouldn't, of course, uh, because the cat's out the bag. And one thing I'll tell you as well, uh, by the time us journalists get the story, a lot of these scheming fucks have already changed it up. I mean, seriously, the amount of times I've gone to reach out to sources and sources tell me, you're right, but that's uh, like as of two weeks ago and now we're doing something else. Uh, it's incredible. It keeps moving. It keeps evolving because there's too much money involved. And the key thing here is control. Everybody wants to control their league, their slice of the pie. They don't want to grow it for everybody. They'll kill Counter-Strike as long as they can get paid now for 18 months. That That is legit. Now, I'll tell you this. My views on exclusivity have, have changed slightly. I do believe there is a need to cut down the number of leagues, especially online leagues in Counter-Strike. But what I find hilarious is you'll see organizations, you know, like, for example, you know, DreamHack, right, who have lost ground in the arms race i mean look at the last dream hack winter it was fairly poor field i'm not lying when a bunch of teams who went there said we shouldn't have come to this one we should have left out prize money wasn't that big and our schedule's too packed um and you know they ref they then come out and announce a record number of events next year shortly after tweeting you know its employees are tweeting well this counter-strike scene's bloody overcrowded isn't it and then you you add more events to the calendar Something's got to give because we're going to kill Counter-Strike. That's if we haven't already, honestly. I saw an interview with Anders recently where Anders said, oh, if we're at the stage where viewers say they don't want to watch this weekend uh, because what's the point? They're playing next weekend or I watched them play last weekend. We're in trouble. We're at that stage. We're at that stage where increasingly the season has no meaning and what we need to do is to stop being greedy yes this game is hot shit yes it's still growing yes it's amazing yes we've got this wonderful infrastructure we've got to work together and have a recognized season with a beginning a middle and an end and breaks otherwise it's all gonna die and i said you know, I, I rejected the idea of exclusivity, but unfortunately, 
we need an agreement. We need some sort of exclusivity, some sort of limitation, or we're in trouble. Now, I don't know what the solution to that problem looks like. I don't, I don't know what the best case of, uh, course of action is. I don't know what the best case scenario is. But we've got to change it. I'm being real here. Or, or by, this, you know, by this time next year, we're fucked. Legit. And I don't want CS to have to go through it again. I've seen it too many times. I've seen the bubbles burst. I don't want to see professionals go from having a salary in fucking January to being on the breadline and having no money uh, by November. I don't want to see that. But I've seen it. I've seen it before and I don't want to ever see it again. So that's what P, that's what PA did. And let me just be clear about some of the details uh, that they're saying here. They want the players to have equity in the league and they'll, ha and they'll have a revenue share. Every player that plays in PEA will get a percentage of the overall revenue share. Not a high percentage, but trust me, uh, they're talking about big numbers. I don't buy them. I don't believe them. I've heard they've leveraged already millions of dollars of sales. I think that's hornswoggle. I think that's nonsense. Uh, I know the challenges of getting sponsors associated, even, you know, especially big brands with big money still in, in Counter-Strike. I know that that can be difficult. Uh, and obviously at, at Turner Sports, we, we've been blessed with not only good people who know how to go out and get those sponsors, but also that brand recognition and that strength. I think PEA uh, might struggle, you know, and that's just my gut feeling. If I'm wrong, happy to be wrong. But anyway, all of those players get a percentage of the revenue. And that sounds great. I like the idea. You commit exclus exclusively to a league and you get a revenue share. Cool. But this was always sold to the players as something that they were thinking about. Uh, not that it would be uh, you, how it was. Like, it, like, this is it now. So we had, uh, you know, the good old uh, guy, Sir Scoot, come out and i'm gonna get into his letter in just a moment so pea say if you play in pea even though there's no contractual agreement in place because you want that equity we're going to use that to leverage it to tell you where you can and can't play now interestingly enough pea is saying hey we don't want you to necessarily be exclusive this is a lie they're not interested in full exclusivity this is uh, you, richard this sounds like you're defending pea Hear me the fuck out. They're not interested in full exclusivity. They were looking to partner up with Face It and have them go into ECS. It was going to be fine to play in ECS. They've certainly said nothing about whether or not they're going to be able to play in E-League, although maybe that's coming. But they certainly said you can't play in ESL. This isn't about exclusivity in its purest form. This is about competitors going at it like a pair of fucking rutting stags. PA are still upset that they didn't get a bunch of money and there's some other stuff, some very weird stuff. ESL have a foothold in America. They want it. And, and they want to fuck ESL over to drive them out. Now, hey, maybe that's good, right? Maybe, yeah, let's fuck ESL. The community hates ESL. You don't know what you're replacing them with. I'm not saying better the devil, you, you know, than, than what you don't. But certainly, I don't like the idea of any one entity having complete autonomy of a region i don't like that nobody should like that you are replacing one evil for another that is not effective that's like the coup in cuba so uh, let's um let's let's just be clear about what they asked they said to the players you can't play in esl absolutely not if you do there'll be sanctions uh and there's no pre-agreement in any contract that enables this. So Scoot became involved. Uh, you know, I, I, it's not something I can do uh, anymore. I don't know if I would be asked. I always try and do a good turn for players behind the scenes. I, I think people know that about me. Uh, you know, sure, p people like Taco might argue with me about the hat rule on Twitter, but I think people, I, I, I could find you many more players whose contracts I've read through and helped them out, who, who, who I've given advice to, who I've helped out of personal situations. There's no question where my loyalties lie. It's to the people that make this scene great, and I believe that's the players. 
But I'm I work for a league organizer now. I I can't be that guy. Uh, if anything, I'm on the wrong side. I'm I'm the enemy potentially. And I, I think E-League's been great in, in how well it treats players and how considerate we are of player needs and how we've worked around other people's events in the calendar. I like the fact we've been completely non-political. I'm, I'm immensely proud, actually, that we've managed to do so much good uh, in a very short space of time. Uh, but obviously, when it comes to player rights and helping players out, I can't be that guy. You know who can be that guy? Sir fucking Scoots. Scott's made his money. He's not financially influenced. Guy's sat on millions. He's been associated with success after success after success. Got Frag, MLG, pioneering uh, outlets in the, the US esports industry. He's an honest guy, an earnest guy. His integrity is beyond reproach. I can't think of a single scandal ever involving him. This is the guy. And just like Jason Katz, and just like me, just like anyone you need in this role, he's a pit bull. He'll go after you. And if he clamps onto your neck, he's not letting go. So he releases a letter uh, and it, they've published it openly. And he's been in talks with PEA trying to basically uh, get them to back off trying to hold players to this insane agreement uh and i'm just gonna look here and put it in uh for you i'm not gonna read the letter it's incredibly long much like this video uh it's it's scott not wanting to leave anything out crucially i'll tell you who signed it and then i'll summarize it for you so cloud nine have signed this clg have signed this immortals have signed this team liquid have signed this. Team Solo Mid have signed this letter. They're all at the bottom. Now these teams are all the players of the real influencers, the power base of PEA. This is a big deal for a lot of reasons. Now let me um, summarize uh, what's basically said here. And Scoots, as I said, has been involved in talks behind the scenes. There is absolutely no reason to doubt any of this. As I said, Scott's honesty is beyond reproach. So, uh, there were players that are in PEA that weren't even aware about PEA existing and coming in, uh, uh, you know, formation coming into existence until it was announced. The players are given a voting system, much like the WISA system, and as you'll, uh, with the arbitrary committee, and again, I'll remind you, there's a video on my YouTube channel which didn't get a lot of attention, didn't make it on a Reddit, I explain why the WISA arbitrary committee is a sham. These committees aren't going to do anything. They're an illusion. This is how players exert their strength. They vote with their feet. They leverage their fan bases. They leverage their brand strength. You don't sit in a room with these people and have a vote because they won't let your vote count. And I'm going to tell you why. Because look at this. Uh, if we go here, well, again, I'll, I'll just have that there. You can look at Scott's beautiful, youthful face. But basically, PEA has a voting system. And three players get to represent the players. And you're like, oh, wow, holy moly, three? Ooh, that's a big deal. But it's three out of seven. And two belong to owners, and two belong to the, the to the league itself, and Jason Katz. So all the team owners would ever need to do is is collude with Katz in the league, and you've got four to three. Players can never win. The house that that that's a game that can very easily be rigged. Now PEA again, it's ESL they have the issue with. Uh, and ESL have been wanting uh, to try and resolve the issue because ESL want to make inroads into America. You've seen them. IEM Oakland's on the map. New York, right? They want to make inroads, but they can't do it without the strongest North American brands because they are the home crowd. That is what they need to be. That, that's what they need to succeed in America, right? And these brands know this. But instead of wanting to do a partnership and, and work out what's fair, they just want to fuck it off. Now, far be it from me to imply 
Not when TSM pulled out of a recent IEM, it was in any way linked. I'm sure it was all just a genuine mistake, and I'm sure there wasn't a financial resolution reached or anything. Uh, but that's that's the situation we, we we're seeing right now. They're like, we want to run these events again. I'm going to tell you what they what was said. Uh, so uh, and and Scoot says here that PEA said we want ESL to get out of North America. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you exactly the basis for this. I've got some quotes here from my sources. So ESL were told to get out of the US and basically relinquish control of, you know, think about it. They've put all this money in. They put Burbank, you got Burbank Studios, you've got all this stuff. So they relinquish their control of anything to do with running US events and basically hand it over to PEA and allow them to rebrand it, even if they use the same infrastructure itself, because what's weird is PEA want to have their uh, talent broadcast in Bucharest, I think using PGL. That's what they want to do. So the, Amer the American League isn't even going to use American talent in America, but they're telling ESL to get out of America because they believe US events should be run by US companies. And they overlook the fact that ESL owns ESEA. You know, again, whatever you think of guys like Torbel, right? Uh, you know, uh, Craig Levine. Uh, whatever you think of these guys, there's no doubt in his contribution to esports. There's no doubting he has helped put American esports on the fucking map back when he was the Team 3D owner and beyond. And I fucking hate ESEA. Right? The Bitcoin mining scandal should have ended that fucking company. It should have buried it. Everybody that's gone back to it now, uh, it, it, fair and it should have been rebranded. It stinks. I'm glad LP Kane isn't there anymore. Thank fuck he's out of esports. He's a fucking joke. But the reality is that is one of the most disgusting abuses of consumer. Right, right I'm, I'm getting off the beaten path. Fuck ESEA. But. ESEA is still a strong American brand with American people that have played a huge part in American esports, in particular Counter-Strike, over the years. I can't deny it. I fucking hate them, but I can't deny it. Because it's just the truth. So, they've completely overlooked that ESEL owns ESEA, and that by telling ESL to get out of America, they're actually going to see some of America's most valuable fucking assets have to leave. And then they get told as well, by the way, uh, get, and, and how's this for a bleak, dystopian esports future for you all? Merry fucking Christmas. There's going to be two kinds of leagues in 2017, and it's going to be one zone by the developer themselves, a la LCS, a la Riot, or one zone by team owners. Again, quote. That's what they got told when they were in the negotiation. Now, funnily enough... ESL don't like being told get the you've got X amount of time to vacate or, the, or we take you down. Because understand, this is the next part of it. What was the offer on the table? What we pull out, what do we get out of it? If ESL pulled out, and you remember in that DK article, it talked about this. If ESL pulled out, they were going to cooperate with a global league. What does that mean? It would have been one event where the uh, top four teams from the now WISA-driven European-centric ESL Pro League would meet the top four teams from the now North American-centric PEA-run league, and they would play against each other. And the fans would go, ooh, isn't this amazing? If ESL don't pull out of North America, you don't get that. It's not much of an incentive, is it? Let's be fucking real. But that's what they were being offered. So, and, and just to uh, add a few other things uh, t to it um, from the Scoots letter, looking at some notes. Um, the, the First of all, there was a deadline, by the way, with the green, all this, and we went past it. Um, and... And this is according to this letter. I, I can't verify this at this time, but again, it's Scott, so I believe it. Uh, it turned out EPL had agreed that they were going to share league revenues with P PEA. So when they ran an event and those teams went there, they were going to offer them money. But that's not enough. They want total control. 
And they went away. They told the players, you can't play in ESL. And players are like, wait a minute, what the fuck? And they said it's in your contract. Now, I don't think it necessarily is in your contract. I think this is gibberish. I don't see it. Unless the players signed it, then, we, you know. But players I'm talking to say it's definitely not there. And PA also said it was going to be, you know, remember when they launched, it was going to be about empowering players, it was going to be a player-owned league, all that initial press release, right, which, uh, you know, I guess, I guess I could read it to you, but we're already running long. You can go out and find it. If not, if it's if they delete it out, I've got a copy. I'll make it publicly available. But now they got told, "quote things change." That's a quote on Scott's letter. So that's now the players are basically at war with their team owners, saying we want the right to choose. And all players agree they're tired, and all players agree the season's ridiculously long, and there's too much Counter Strike, and they want a fucking break. But this isn't what they wanted. You, they want choice. They want freedom of movement. They want to be able to say, we, we play in this league. We didn't agree to only play in this league. We like playing in those ESL events. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Because not everyone will agree with that. Some will be fine with it. I've seen lots of players tweet about how shit ESL events have treated them this year. And even the fucking flying DJ, who's another fucking guy who lacks any self-awareness whatsoever, went on Reddit recently and apologized for how bad the events had been and that they were incredibly frustrated and endeavored to do better. I mean, the same old spiel. We've heard it a million times. But, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, that still these players just want the right. They want the right to decline. It's not about... It, it's not about, like, fucking, you know, this event shit so fine. You know, they just want to choose. And, I, and I've, got to, I've got to support that. I've got to support the players' right to play where they want and not be dictated to by somebody else on a non-contractual basis where they can and can't play. So that's a huge problem. Now, here's the thing. You're going to go, well, all these owners are pieces of shit. And understand that's not true. Some of these owners are being led down the garden path by Jason Katz. Jason Katz has been given the mandate... Some agree, some don't, some just want to get more money, some don't necessarily want to smash ESL to pieces, and some would rather the whole fucking thing just wasn't uh, getting done at all. And here's what's interesting. Some team owners have said, you know what, they wanted, they were going to help PEA, and then they backed the fuck out and said, this isn't what we're doing. I will not put my name on something that fucks over players. And I'll give you two names, because these guys are fucking heroes. And they're, getting, and they're getting no fucking credit for it. And that's Hector Rodriguez at fucking uh, Optic. And Rick Fox at Echo Fox. They won't put their name on that shit. They won't fuck over a player's right to choose. Because that's not what they're about. They're about empowering players. That's what their brand stand for. And, they, and they've got investment. They don't need to go to war with ESL. It's, it's tin pot shit. It's bollocks to them. Now what a fucking coincidence... Let's look at the Rick Fox situation. Again, these are just coincidences. You join the fucking dots if you want. But what a, what a, what a surprise. That around about the same time Rick Fox says, I don't want to put my name on this. Publications start writing about him like he's a bad guy. Like he's involved in poaching. That writer empowering to poach League of Legends teams. You might not have heard about this if you're a Counter-Strike fan. I'm going to... um bring this up for you this is an article on uh you know the jens hilger owned the esports observer or rather yep yeah, jens hilger has a financial stake in it uh just keep that in mind uh but i uh, sources tried to feed me this story and make me publish this and i'm like guys this doesn't seem right to me i need to verify it and other people jumped on it and the headline's pretty lurid. NALCS team signed Riot's 2017 LCS agreement under threats of league approved poaching and sale cancellation. Now, fuck Riot Games. Always fuck Riot Games. From now until the end of time, Riot Games have done more despicable things in esports than almost any other company. There's others that are trying to take that crown, sure. But I've been banging that fucking drum for years, and look where that's got me, right? So, just fuck that for a second, right? Let's talk about what this is. 
let's talk about what this is. And there was an, there was an a, 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 there was an issue, and again, this was over at uh, published at Slingshot as, as well as well as here, where Echo Fox were accused publicly uh, by by the owner of trying to poach a player called Adrian, um, and that Riot Games were uh, empowering Rick Fox to be able to go out and make illegal approaches under Riot's rules to get players. Um, and, and these other team owners were outraged by it. Now, how fucking strange the timing, right? Because I'll tell you this. Rick Fox, first of all, got fucked over when he first came in the scene. We all remember what happened with the visas you don't remember what happened with the visas let me tell you some of the owners on pa had a meeting right they met privately and they were threatened by rick fox and his uh, sudden arrival into esports and even though they met him and they all love high-fiving the celebrity and hanging out with him oh it's so cool to hang out with a celebrity like all of that childish nonsense when they realized he wanted to be here for long term didn't want to buy any of their brands wanted to build his own brand now they wanted to fuck him. So they, they, they basically leveraged Riot privately to have a particular long look at Echo Fox's visas. And they were playing on, on, on the visas that, in the past, League of Legends players had been allowed to play on them. And then they said, hey, Riot, what's up with this? And Reginald made a tweet. Obviously, we all remember that one. And it just sp spirals from there. And all of a sudden, Echo Fox can't play players. And we all know where they are now. Right? So that was his introduction to esports. Then he went, and, and, and this is true, this is what they call it, kissing the ring. You have to go to certain team owners and basically show fealty, pledge that, look, you have it. You're the kings, we're the secondary, we're just here to lend our brand strength. And Rick did that, he bent the knee to these guys. And this is, again, well documented, you know. I'm not even getting it from the fucking horse's mouth, you can talk to any fucking team owner. Like, this, this... This is legit. This is how it goes. This is the childish treehouse bullshit going on in esports in 2016. And Rick, Rick fucking had to bend the knee. Um, and they were like, okay, cool. And then, you know, it smoothed over. Didn't really help Echo Fox out any. Uh, you know, and they got, they got the CS team together. And, you know, it wasn't a great team. Didn't quite work out. It was an experiment. But Rick said, hey, I'll be in PA. I'll, you know, I'm, I'm on board with this. And I'll definitely... And Rick's a big deal. You know, Rick Fox carries you know a, a lot of weight he's a film star he's a tv star you, you know he's he's a, he's a business owner he's an entrepreneur he's got connections so he is a big deal but then when they started doing this he didn't want to be involved so all of a sudden now he's a poacher let me tell you right off the fucking bat riot games are the bad guys in that situation because they their rules are flexible What's this player database bullshit? But here's the point. If Echo Fox say to Riot, can I approach this player? And they go, yes, that will be within the rules. And they approach the player. Why is it Echo Fox out of the bad guys? And the entire community in League of Legends is blindly accepting this and saying we all suck Rick Fox's dick. Nothing could be further from the fucking truth. This guy's been shit on for trying to get into esports. And it's because he's a threat to established people. It's insane. And then you look over at Optic, and Optic is just like, do you know what? We don't even fucking need to be playing these games. We're fucking Optic gaming. And I love Hex for that. As soon as he got any whiff that players were going to get fucked over, he's like, yeah, 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 I'm out. Not only that, though. Fucking, they wanted money to be involved. And he's like, shit, um, again, Optic gaming brings you something. I ain't paying to be part of this. So, so it's nonsense. Whole thing's fucking nonsense. And as I said, those guys are the type of owner that you want. Those guys are the type of owner that make esports great, right? Really. So, Rick Fox gets absolutely fucked over. I mean, just ridiculously. So that's the level here that we're operating at. If you don't go with the fucking flow, if you don't go in the direction PEA wants you to, they'll hurt you. So... Players are going to be worried right now. You know. Right. So, let's start winding this up. What's PEA's end goal? What do they want? How are they going to make money? What are they going to get into? And it's all about broadcasting deals. Let me tell you what they want. They want that hermetically sealed league 
where they can go out and get uh, broadcasting rights for the league. So they're going to have exclusivity of these teams. And, you know, it's not even decided what the teams are going to be yet because all this drama and politics. And they want to sell that to whoever, whoever the highest bidder will be and broadcast it. And that's where Jason Katz definitely comes in. Because he might be a fighter and he might keep you in a constant uh, you know, period of war. He might be the war consigliere, right? But he also does have the connect to bring broadcasters in. Now, let's look at what Wiesa are doing. How very interesting. Who did Wiesa appoint? Uh, they appointed Ken Hirschman. Did you see that? Here you go, I'll show you. You probably missed it. You probably didn't think it was a big deal. Uh... Here it is. So, hang on, that's fucking opening a bit slow. All right, fuck it, let's do, let's do it with this one. So, I was trying to take it off a, a relatively neutral source, but whatever. We all know the we all know the compromisation here. So, we sir, obviously reported on the Esports Observer, uh, announced HBO Sports President Ken Hirschman. What do you think his background is? Do you think he he's ever watched esports? Do you think he knows what the fuck is going on? No, but I'll tell you this: he definitely knows how to get you a broadcasting deal. So, this is the exclusivity that we're talking about. They want to get these teams. And maybe more. If you want to join, if you want to play ball, they're going to give you some money. They're going to get some merchandise. They're going to hype it up. They're going to make you play in a league and only in that league. And then they're going to sell the they're going to sell the broadcasting rights to that league, to TV or, or a new streaming platform. It gets more complicated. Obviously, Jason Katz is from Azubu. Had ties over there, right? Let me tell you that that these tournament organizers are looking to buy their own platforms broadcasting platforms so they can cut out the middleman so they don't even need to negotiate these deals let's get a platform mark cuban's meant to be building one of them by the way he says that's what he would like to do smash the twitch paradigm so this is what they're this is what they're looking to do I'm hearing rumors ESL are getting one. I'm hearing rumors of PA are looking to buy one. Everyone wants one. They all want their own streaming platforms, their own players, and they'll put it there exclusively and pull it off Twitch. Maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe it's a good thing. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, honestly. It depends what comes with it. Pay-per-view? You know? Nah, maybe not. Maybe they do it for free, front load pre-roll. What if the service isn't as good? What if it lags? Who knows, right? But... You know, or maybe it does go on to a cable channel. Or maybe it goes on to an, uh, you know. But this is what's happening. They are trying to be hermetically sealed. So it's complete control. We got the teams. We got the players. We got the owners. We got the revenue. We got the platform to broadcast it. That is what they're looking to do. That's what everybody is looking to do. And like I say, that's why Ken Hirschman's appointed. That's why Jason Katz probably isn't going anywhere. Now, let me tell you just another thing here. Let me let me talk a little bit about this. Uh, this came up. Cloud9 and TSM, obviously two of the big players in PEA. You saw this story that was announced, right? And I'm just putting this out here for your consideration. Video's already run long. Here you go. Twitch to partner with TSM and Cloud9 on new sponsorships. Crucially here, crucially, uh, the statement that um, was released by Twitch was literally that, uh, you know, they, they are going to represent Cloud9 and TSM. And they are going to go out and it's not a sponsorship. They are going to get them non-endemic sponsors. They're going to go out there and represent Cloud9 and TSM when it comes to getting sponsors. Now, that's interesting because those brands and others wanted to leave Twitch because when Twitch bought the Good Game Agency, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, I don't give a fuck. The Good Game Agency was a terrible acquisition for, for Amazon, for Twitch. It was a way for an old friend to help out another old friend and make them wealthy. I don't, it didn't fit into the business model. It makes no sense. It was only going to cause conflict. Hell, according to my report that I did, which obviously got ignored again, uh, who knows if it was even an agency? It looked like it was labeling itself an agency, but they didn't have the right licenses or, or, or an attorney at the helm. Looked like a bit of a mess. Looked like a shit show. 
Uh, and that's before we even get into EG and Alliance rebranding and try and show there's no collusion or issues there. I mean, holy shit. Alex Garfield did it before these guys. He just didn't do it big enough, right? So you have that going on. And anyway, when GGA came in, one of the things that was going on also behind the scenes and, uh, you know, it never came out at the time, so, so pay attention to this, uh, was that... Um, a lot of these teams, a lot of these brands were like, well, hang on a minute, right? So we've got Evil Geniuses and Alliance, and we've got GGA, and you're saying we have to let Alex Garfield and GGA handle our sponsorships, but we know for a fact that um, they're getting preferential treatment. Because, okay, let me let me give you an, a made-up scenario. An Evil Genius player, or Evil Geniuses want to get a player. Cloud9 want to get a player. They both go out to the player. Cloud9 is a Twitch partner, but isn't represented by GGA, i.e. a company owned by Amazon and Twitch. Evil Geniuses want that same player. They have that benefit. They go, hey, look, we can guarantee that, you know, your personal stream will be on the fucking front page of Twitch whenever the fuck we want, actually, brother. Like, it ain't a thing. We got all this extra money coming in. Like, yeah, we can do you a bunch of deals that, you know, these guys can't. Cloud9 are like, hang on, they're leveraging money from one of our partners and a service from one of our partners to act as a rival fuck this and of course it was stupid i can't be against that uh be being upset about that i can't be against that because it is it is insane and they didn't want to acquiesce and let alex garfield run their sponsorships for them because they didn't trust him to do a fair deal because he was the old guard right and they're the new upstarts now they're the old guard Alex Garfield's been deposed, and now these new upstarts like Rick Fox are getting the beat. Weird how it all goes round, isn't it? So, that's what happened over there at Twitch, and it got so bad, all of those big brands that are associated with League of Legends were going to leave Twitch and move to uh, another platform to basically... Uh, you know, fuck Twitch over because they didn't want to acquiesce to that nonsense. And again, I can agree with that, honestly. Brandon Beck from Riot had to come in and act as an intermediary to sue for peace. Like, hey, let's all just stay on the platform. Hey, let's all just be pals. You know, this is how the money gets made. Because Twitch and Riot, by the way, right? Sim motherfucking Patico. And don't think for a second they ain't. Which is why you can't say anything bad about fucking a Riot employee or anything like that. Or you're just going to get straight fucking banned off the platform. You know? Don't, and, and, and that's why so many people go from Riot to Twitch. You know, yeah. No connections there. So, uh, anyway, all of that happened, and of course, they, they finally got it. They finally got to push Alex Garfield out. It worked. That was part of this agreement going through. So they weren't happy with it when Alex Garfield was going to do it. But now they're happy that Twitch is going to do what they were doing for EG for them. Welcome, welcome to eSports, folks. Where principles are irrelevant. Just make that money. So that's just for your consideration. That should show you the kind of clout that some of these PEA uh, team owners have. And and honestly, it's it's only going to get dirtier in 2017. I haven't got time in this video to start telling you about some of the other stuff I've talked about. And that is a relationship between Twitch and two big brands. And the brands are in uh, the, the brands are obviously closely linked. Uh, you know, because Jack used to work over at TSM, and then obviously they're in they're in uh, PEA. So there's a link there, and 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 on it flows, and downward it trickles, and. That's before we even get into Twitch funding at ECS. I, you know, look, look, I've been talking about mul like things like multiple team ownerships and conflict of interests for years. No one cares. They just want to keep the games going. They just want to keep the fireworks display going. But there are some profound issues that come up. And if you think this is bad and this is a clusterfuck, let me tell you what else is going on behind the scenes. So there's another league in the works. And it involves some of the people that fund Astralis. And what do Astralis fund other than Astralis? Well, it ain't just Astralis. Those are the brands. We know they got ties to Godsent. We know they have their own agency. And they want to fund multiple teams. What's going to happen there? Are those brands going to be franchised into that league? Because they're not in Wisa. They're not in PA. So now we've got three leagues. And what's going to happen with ES Force? ES Force own Na'Vi, VP, SK. What else? They own their own leagues their own tournament organizers their own streaming platforms this is it guys this is what's happening counter-strike 
is now going to end into a phase in 2017 where it's a cold war. And thanks to venture capital and all of the money coming in, we can all, everyone's going to try and starve each other out. And the people that are going to suffer are the fans, the players, people like me who can't stand to see this type of divide in the fucking scene to ultimately go against what is needed to preserve the lifespan of this game. I, at this stage, I'm begging for Valve to come in. And I don't like developers being hands-on. But I want Valve to come in and fucking save us from this madness. Because that's where we're at. And it, it, it's only going to get worse, guys. Honestly. So, there's loads I've missed out in this long rambling video. I'm trying to give you some of the, the highlights, some stuff that you didn't know, put all of this in context. It's gonna make me deeply unpopular. Uh, as soon as this video goes out, people are gonna watch it, people are gonna message me, people are gonna fucking tell me that they'll never talk to me again. I just don't care anymore, guys. I just don't fucking care anymore. I'm sick of watching Counter-Strike just get, f and, and players and everything just get fucking used to make a small amount of people money. I'm tired of it. I just want the game to flourish. I just want what's good for the scene. I want what's good for the players. And I'm 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 not gonna fucking play around anymore, honestly. There's 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 more to come on this. Uh yeah, thanks for watching.